Thank, thanks for having us, Bill. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, Bill Carlson asked us to be uh, to join you all to talk a little bit about the history of the Bay and uh, its development. And, and uh, Rodney and I wrote a book about uh, uh, five years ago now, four years ago, uh, that focuses on that. And the reason that we picked that is there's some great, great history books on Tampa that speak to the uplands and the different events and times and, and uh, the periods. Uh, but there wasn't really anything focusing on the bay, how it had developed to what it is today. And we got into this project and, and came up with a, a pretty good outline that uh, uh, speaks of the prehistory and recent history and gets us up to uh, what you see out there today and makes a few predictions on what the future may bring based on known projects or known plans. We didn't try to use a crystal ball on that. Um, uh, I know a little bit about the port. No way I could have uh, uh, addressed the, the history without Rodney. So I was, I was lucky enough to get him to join and, and help me with this. So uh, we, were, we were given a time frame of about 10 minutes. So uh, when Rodney and I were talking about that last night, he said he's gonna cover about 500 years in five minutes. <laughs> and, and, and then uh, I'll probably put a few minutes into what you see out there in the port today and how I got here and then maybe a few predictions on the future. So, Ronnie? Thank you, Arthur, thank you all so much. If it's 500 years in six minutes, I hope you all don't mind. <laughs> but uh, but not, obviously our, our book is about water and the waterfront, but uh, really Florida history, and Florida's kind of story is one of water. And so it, sometimes it's too much water, sometimes it's not enough water, but, but water is a, a real central part of the overall Florida story. And even going back before there were people in the, before there were land animals. Florida, at one point, several million years ago, was covered uh, with water. Uh, maybe a little bit of the ridge, uh, the Brooksville Ridge was exposed, but for the most part, the entire Florida Peninsula and Panhandle were underwater. And that's important because of the sea creatures that were swimming around over Florida, in, in a sense, after they died and they kind of fell to the bottom of the sea and millions of years passed, uh, they, with other uh, elements, turn into phosphate. And so the phosphate industry that we have is, is exists in part because of the geological history of Florida and the fact that Florida at one point was underwater. Uh, when we finally have a peninsula, that's somewhat recognizable. Again, water plays an important role in human history. And really with the Tampa Bay area in particular, you know, we have very, there's several different bodies of water that make up the Tampa Bay area. You've got uh, three different bays, uh, old Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay, which is the largest body, uh, and then Hillsborough Bay, which is the, the body of water right outside uh, here along uh, Bay Shore and downtown. And then of course the Hillsborough River and then other smaller rivers and creeks that all feed into the bay. And it's that water, the fresh water of the rivers and the salt water that creates this estuary that uh, provided a, a wonderful place for people to first come to I'm not talking about you know 500 years ago, but I'm talking you know thousands of years ago with the early native people. Uh, but those people knew the same thing that, that we do. Again, it's, it's the, the source of fresh water and the source of food uh, that is provided by that makes this a natural place to to settle. Uh, when the Europeans arrived around 500 years ago, they found these native people here who had been living here for thousands of years. Uh, there wasn't uh, there were attempts at colonization, but that never came to pass. Uh, through the, by the Europeans, and so it really wasn't until the early 1800s uh, that you had American or kind of European settlement in this area specifically. Uh, you had a place called Spanish Town Creek, uh, or Spanish Town, on Spanish Town Creek, which was a creek that ran through Hyde Park, uh, emptied into Hillsborough Bay, about where Swan Avenue is, again, settling on the waterfront. So those were Cuban fishermen who were here seasonally uh, fishing in the bay. And then that was kind of turn of the, the, the uh, between the 1700s and 1800s. And then by 1824, you have a military base that's established in what is now downtown Tampa, and that's Fort Brooke. Again, there's no uh, accident why Fort Brooke was sited where it is. The mouth of the river, uh, look, overlooking Hillsborough Bay, a, a good position to be for, for uh, particularly for our ships coming in, because it was through ship travel that people really got around 
Florida. Uh, overland travel was very, very difficult, and during that time, dangerous because uh, of, kind of open hostility between, uh, at that time, Americans and Seminoles who were living in Florida. So it was much safer and just much more efficient to arrive to Florida and travel around Florida by water. Uh, and that's why you know, almost all the settlements at that time were on, uh, on the coastline, very few settlements in the interior of Florida. Uh, the military fort provided a, uh, a kind of uh, base of operations for the military, but also a nucleus for a little town to grow just to the north, and that town became Tampa. And uh, some of the earliest jobs in Tampa were related both to the port, excuse me, to the, to the fort, uh, but also to a little uh, nascent uh, port uh, called Tampa Harbor along the Hillsborough River. And it was that little harbor and the fishing that went along with that, some trade that went along with that, that, uh, that drew more settlement here, including a man named James McKay. And James McKay uh, arrived with his family in the 1840s, and he really was one of the first to establish any kind of major shipping uh, in and out of Tampa. And in the 1850s, that shipping included cattle going from Tampa to Cuba, uh, one of many connections between Tampa and, and Florida in general and Cuba, uh, going back again you know, thousands of years with Native people, but really, over the course of the past 500 years, there's been these incredible connections between uh, Tampa and northern Cuba. And this was reestablished and reinforced by Captain McKay in the 1850s. Uh, by the 1880s, uh, Tampa finally was, was uh, connected overland to kind of the outside world via the railroad when Henry Plant brought his railroad here in the 1880s. Uh, but he also, Plant, brought steamships. And so it was really the steamships and the, uh, the discovery of phosphate in the Hillsborough River and in the Peace Valley uh, area south of here that really brought the, the port, with the modern port that we have today. First with the Port Tampa, Port Tampa City down by the Air Force Base, and then the turn of the 20th century, the, uh, the Port of Tampa that uh, we know today. And that's really, of course, Arthur's family uh, starts off with the McKays coming here, but really the, the savage side comes with the Atlantic Coast Line Railroad and Port Tampa City. And so I'll turn it back over to Arthur to tell kind of the personal and professional story of the port through you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and the, uh, as those ports developed, you know, the, the original cattle were going out of Ballast Point, uh, which is very, very shallow. Uh, those were shallow draft schooners, a long pier that got out to about 10 feet of water. And uh, then in 1886, when Plant developed Port Tampa, that brought deep water, I think it was about 22, 23 feet. Uh, and everything shifted there. The rail conveniently took everything down. And then uh, when Plant sold to the Atlantic coastline, their competitor, the Seaboard coastline, said, we need something too. And so they started developing down here with efforts through uh, legislation to dredge this harbor and put a phosphate terminal over here. Uh, so in 1904, I think that legislation was uh, created and dredging started. In 1905, uh, what is now Harbor Island, then Seddon Island was developed. And uh, if, if geographically, if you all go on what's Water Street, you know, on this side of the Marriott and draw a line directly east and then west and connect it with Bayshore, that was the shoreline. And everything south of that is dredged up. Uh, they say that that's about the largest dredging project in the U.S. Uh, cumulatively over the years, it creates, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of acreage. But it went from that to Davis Islands, which Rodney's written a book on as well, uh, to Hooker's Point, uh, which is not <laughs> named that for apparent reasons. William <laughs> Dunner. Yeah. Um, and then the whole, uh, you know, Port Sutton area, Big Ben, Port Manatee, uh, Port Manatee being the latest uh, uh, major development that started in uh, 1972. So uh, our port uh, at its peak, which was 1992, uh, was the seventh largest port in the country by tonnage. We were doing 52 million tons a year in this port and moving, uh, moving that on about 12,000 vessel calls a year. So it was a very, very uh, busy port. Uh, unfortunately,
unfortunately, we're down about 20 million tons, uh, and that's a, a, a whole number of things. Uh, some you can put in the good column, some in the bad column. Uh, you know, uh, in the late 70s, with the Arab uprising, our government felt that they needed to give money to the Moroccans and the Jordanians and such. Well, they dug huge phosphate mines that started competing with us. Now we're moving less than half of the phosphate that we used to. Uh, also, the Chinese have come up with that. Um, one thing that has been really good for the community, uh, but bad for the port, is all of our coal and oil-fired power plants have changed to liquid natural gas uh, as a result of the fracking, making it available and cheap, unfortunately via pipeline, so not ships that used to transport that fuel. That represents uh, over 8 million tons right there. Now, our air is cleaner, our bay is cleaner, so as a community, we definitely benefited from that. As a port, it was devastating. That was uh, the largest uh, U.S. flag dry bulk uh, fleet in the, in the country was TECO Transport. And uh, it was beautifully balanced, bringing uh, phosphate, uh, excuse me, coal over here from the Mississippi River and uh, uh, sometimes from Virginia for the you know, eastern mines, and then taking phosphate rock and fertilizers back to the Mississippi River to be distributed into the heartland uh, for fertilizer. And uh, that balance, uh, once the coal and oil went away, all of a sudden it was uh, not as, as uh, efficient to take those things north and uh, actually gave a competitive edge to the railroad. And, and a lot of it went to the railroad. So a lot of shipyard uh, 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 jobs were lost, a lot of seagoing jobs were lost, stevedores, terminal operators, things like that. So uh, we've gone through our, our trials and tribulations. The great thing is we're a very diversified port. We handle liquid bulk. Uh, we're still doing about 18 million tons. Uh, it's, it's down to about 17 right now because of the virus. Not as many commuters. We have, uh, you know, since March of last year, have had no international flights, so the aviation fuel is down. Uh, you know, Tampa fuels via pipeline the Air Force Base, which is the tanker base, uh, Tampa International, Orlando International, and Sarasota. Um, and, and so we're moving a lot of fuel. We're what's called a clean port. They're all clean, ready to burn products. There's no refineries here. Uh, so there's no crude oil here. Uh, the cruise industry obviously shut down, and, and that had a devastating effect on the Port Authority's financials because they own those three bursts. But as well, all those vendors that supply, I mean, how'd you like to have a lettuce concession for three ships of 5,000 person capacity feeding them three times a day? It's, it's big business. It's really big business. Uh, the the uh, fuel barges that fuel them up have been dormant. Uh, that will come back. We do containers, we do a lot of dry bulk. Uh, uh, since we're not burning uh, coal and recovering that fly ash and the slag from the boilers, we're now importing that. What do you use that nasty stuff for? Well, that's a big additive in concrete. Uh, it, it, it helps on the concrete strength, on the resiliency, uh, so that's a big additive. Uh, and so those kind of products, we're doing a lot of, uh, uh, the, the cars have diminished, because uh, car sales diminished, uh, but we're very diversified. And we are down as a port about 10% because of COVID, but again, there are ports like Canaveral that are 75% crews that are just devastated. Miami, devastated. Uh, but Port Everglades, they're a balance of, of crews and containers and cargo and oil. They're doing okay. We're doing okay. Port Manatee's doing okay. So um, that's where we are there. I want you all to keep an eye out, too, for a big threat that's coming out, too, that's along the lines of the two that I mentioned that, that hurt our phosphate and our fuel. Uh, there's actually a bill that was pulled in the city council by Joe Citro uh, Proposing that they forbid all fossil fuels and 
the construction of any fossil fuel infrastructure by 2030. That was in his first meeting. Um, scientifically, it's not possible. You, you can't do away with that in nine years because the technology isn't there to burn the, you know, to create the energy and such. Um, it, it'll, it'll move to that, everybody's making a big effort, but something like that, which is apparently gonna come back up in March, would shut down our airport, would shut down our port, would shut down our Air Force base. Everybody would have to sell your gas car and get a battery car, whether you can afford it or not. Everybody would have to cut the gas line to their house and they go dark because TECO's only at 7% renewable energy right now. And they can't get to 100% in that time frame. They're working for it. Scientifically, they'll get there someday, but they ain't getting there in nine years. So the, the, the things like that that sound great, without a lot of thought, are, are very dangerous. And uh, you, you, you're talking about the, the devastating effect. It's gonna come back in March, it's gonna be watered down, but we gotta be careful because those kind of things uh, can, can really hurt a lot. So um, on the future, I think I'm probably running on, off on time here, but the Port Authority is trying to add uh, another cruise berth. There's another. There's enough demand for that. Uh, you know, they're they're trying to buy some private property to extend that up to the end of uh, Port uh, well, Ebor Channel, and and uh, there's some uh, sort of competing interests that want to do residential developments on that water. And over the years, we've got some zoning in there to try and protect that deep water. For shipping, um, uh, we think that the, the travel that, that we have uh, is going to continue. Uh, the fuel will will slowly diminish uh, as as these renewables become uh, more practical and, and cost effective. Uh, I think the containers will continue to grow a little bit. If if, if everybody in here looks at the label on their clothes. I bet nobody will find anything made in the U.S. Most of it is imported. You look at your furniture, rooms to go, uh, that is now coming directly in here. It used to come into Charleston and Miami and Savannah and then be trucked into this area. We're now getting direct shipments. So uh, the Port Authority has done some great things by adding gantry cranes and things to handle those ships. So I, I think with our diversification and our view towards the future, Tampa will be good uh, well into the future. Those, those great blue collar jobs that uh, uh, the, port, the port employs, I think are safe as long as we don't have any you know, craziness in terms of uh, you know, regulation and things like that. So um, that's all I got. Why don't you tell us about the quotes behind you? We're gonna go right here. All right, so, uh, so this is the book that, uh, that Arthur and I uh, wrote, and it's funny because we obviously have a chapter, the last chapter is about what we kind of thought about the future, uh, but this book was written several years ago at this point, and so some of the things that we talked about as being the future, uh, potential future things, are actually come to pass, one of them, or at least coming to pass, and one of the projects that was at the, its very beginnings when we started writing this was uh, the Water Street Tampa project, and that, a, a lot of that property that uh, SPP is converting into this whole kind of big mixed use uh, redevelopment was a port and port related property not necessarily owned by the port uh, was, they do uh, they are you know operating sparkling wharf uh, on port property but uh, but the, the neighborhood that Water Street Tampa occupies it's a neighborhood called the Garrison and the Garrison uh, was actually a, an African American neighborhood uh, that uh, started around the turn of the 20th century as the port began to grow. Uh, a, a lot of longshoremen and, uh, and their families lived in this, this neighborhood, mostly African Americans. And, uh, and there are also warehouses in that same, that same area that all supported the port. So you had these, uh, these kind of ancillary industries and these, and these people who were working in those industries uh, who lived in this neighborhood. And now it's being converted uh, to this giant mixed use uh, project. Uh, the, the garrison had kind of ceased to exist as a community by the 
1960s, 1970s, so most of this property was, was vacant uh, when the SPP people began acquiring it uh, several years ago. But, uh, but what was then just kind of a future endeavor, uh, as we wrote in the book, is now certainly coming to pass. And anybody who's been by the History Center, uh, which is on Water Street, uh, has uh, sure seen the incredible growth around us. And so where we didn't really have a whole lot of neighbors when we opened, uh, I guess, 11, 12 years ago now, uh, we now have lots of neighbors, and we're going to have neighbors li living right next door to us literally in just a few months as those apartments uh, start opening. So it's been a lot of a lot of growth in our part of the world, uh, and, and former industrial land being converted. As Arthur said, you know, a lot of this uh, property that used to be heavy industrial is is now there's competition with making it uh, more accessible to the public uh, or more you know residential uh, uses and moving away from poor uses. And so again, you know, we we can see the the benefits of that, it looks prettier, um, but once those buildings are built and people are living in them, uh, the jobs that used to kind of occupy those lands are, uh, are not as prevalent. And so as you have even more service-related jobs, uh, which pay less than a lot of these court jobs, which, which are very high-paying blue-collar jobs. And so there is a, a, a bit of a balance that, that needs to be sought when, when we're looking at converting former court land or current court land uh, into uh, uses that aren't really directly related to 